Now, if I say Elijah, I apologize. I get these names confused a lot. Not because I don't know who I'm talking about, but I have a son named Elijah. And, well, it just can be a problem for me. But in this, in this account that we, we've already read through it, and we'll go back and read it here again in a moment, but I want us to understand the significance of what's getting ready to take place. There's a historical significance. At this time, in, in, in the nation of Israel, uh, the, the people of Israel are following their king. Uh, they, they, they don't have a good king. When, when Elijah comes on the scene, uh, does, does anybody know who the king is? His name is King Ahab, right? And he wasn't known as one of the best kings. In fact, he was known as the exact opposite, one of the worst kings. He married a woman named Jezebel. That's what you want to name your children, right? No. Uh, and she, was, she was even more wicked than he was. In fact, she pushed him into more wickedness. Uh, they they uh, rose up t- temples to worship Baal and, and Baal Peor and all these other, uh, other things. They sacrificed their children to God. It, it was a terrible, terrible uh, time in the nation of Israel. They led the people of Israel into a time uh, 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 to, to worship these other idols. And here's a question. When you're worshiping something other than God, what does that do to your relationship with God? It destroys it. They, they were following after Baal and Baal Peor and these other, these other false gods. They were, they, were, they were living unrighteous and ungodly lives. Uh, it, was, it was a terrible time in, in the nation of the people of Israel. I also want you to understand that, that there were still some who loved God and worshipped God, who refused to kneel uh, down to worship Baal, uh, this false god. Uh, Elijah was a prophet who was brought up. The Bible tells us he was a Tishbite uh, until he, he confronts Ahab. And we don't, and back in 1 Kings, uh, we, we don't have a whole lot of information about him other than he was Elijah the Tishbite. But when he confronts the king, uh, uh, God had told him to, to tell the king, hey, it's not going to rain anymore and, and, uh, until, uh, until God says it's, it's going to rain. And for three years, there was a period of no rain. Uh, and then uh, Elijah got up, uh, as God told him to, he went up and confronted the, the prophets of Baal and, and the king and, and all of his men and brought all the nation of Israel before. And we, there was a great battle in 1 Kings chapter 18. Does anybody remember what happens in that, in, when I say great battle, it's a, it's a battle of our God versus their false gods. And, and what happened in that battle? Fire rains down from heaven at, at, at the very request uh, from, from Elijah. And, and, uh, and Elijah goes and he kills the, 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 uh, the, the prophets of Baal, the 450 prophets of Baal. And the people of Israel, they see, they see the work of God and they said, he is our God, he is our God. What a day that was for the people of Israel as they saw God for who he truly was and they began to worship him. But something happened right after that battle. See, wickedness wasn't completely uh, destroyed and there were still those that, that, uh, that, had, that were following after Baal. In fact, Jezebel said to Elisha, by this day tomorrow, you're going to be dead. And what happens to Elijah? He runs off into the wilderness and he says, God, just kill me now. I'm all by myself. There's nobody else. Uh, and this wicked woman, Jezebel, wants to kill me. Just kill me now, Lord. And God says, what are you doing here? And he sent up to a mountain. And on and that mountain, he revealed to him that there were 7,000, that he was not alone. There were 7,000 uh, that uh, had not bowed their knee to Baal. And he says, listen, I'm not done with you yet. There are some more things that, that need to take place. And one of those things was to go and uh, uh, to, to anoint another man to follow after him, and that man was Elisha. He found Elisha in First Kings chapter nineteen, and, this, and we and this is where this we find him there, and he's he's just plowing the ground. He's just out working. He's he's got his oxen. He's got his he he's got his uh, the. Uh, whatever you call it, the stuff that you plow the ground with, uh, uh, the, the equipment there, and, and he, he's working, and Elisha walks along, and he takes his mantle off, and he throws it on Elijah. This mantle that fell from his shoulders in, in 2 Kings chapter 2 was placed upon his shoulders, and it was a symbol, it was a sign that, this, that, that God has anointed you, God has called you to be a prophet of him. Can I just stop here and tell you, for, for, tell you a moment, folks, that God has a plan for each and every one of your lives. You say, well, no, I, I'm, just a, I'm just a nobody. So it wasn't Elisha. 
So uh, Now listen, I'm not going to say that you're all going to be preachers. I'm not going to say that you're all going to be missionaries. But my goodness, don't we need somebody with a heart to say, God, I will do whatever you want me to do, and I will go wherever you want me to go, and I will just submit my life unto you. God, my life isn't mine anymore. Can I, can I prove to you from Scripture that in Jeremiah, uh, God told Jeremiah, before you, I formed thee in the belly of your, of your mother, I knew you, and I have chosen you to be a prophet amongst your, my people. God will choose and has chosen you for something. God has not chosen us to sit here. Uh, we, he's put us here together for a purpose that we might serve God and bring honor and glory to God here together in unity as a body of believers. We don't just come here because it's fun. I, I, I love getting together with you all. I love you all. But we're not just here to, 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 to be here together. We're to learn together. We're to encourage one another. We're to, we're to serve one another and serve God. And we need to, and my goodness, sometimes, somewhere along the line, listen, I'm going to not be the pastor of this church anymore. Somewhere along the line, those of you who have been serving here as teachers for years and years aren't going to be able to teach anymore. Some, some of you, uh, some, some of you, uh, and I, 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 I'm just going to say this, God's got to anoint somebody to be willing to say, God, whatever you want me to do, whether it's to teach a Sunday school class or whether it's to preach, no matter what it is, God, I just, I'm just willing to let you direct my path today. Young people, I'm talking to you. Yet you need to have a harsh desire. This says, God, I'll take my plans and I'll set them aside because I know that your will is better than mine. Because listen, I don't care what you do on this earth. If you're out of the will of God, my your goodness, you will be miserable. Now God gives us a choice, and we're going to get to that here in a few minutes uh, as we go through this. But I, I want to encourage you to have a heart like Elisha did when that mantle was thrown upon him. I want you to know what he did. He didn't say, hey, listen, I'll think about it for a while. Let, let me go back and consult with some other people. Let me see how my life goes. And you know what he did? He, he went back and he told his family, hey folks, I'm leaving. Uh, God's called me to go and do this. And, and he took that, that oxen that he, that, that he was using to pull, to pull the equipment and he slaughtered it and he killed it and he took the equipment and he broke it up and he used it and he built a, a sacrifice right there. There's a memorial of what God had called him to do and he was leaving one life for another. Listen, if you are saved here today, you have left one life and you're on your way to another and God is calling you to service. God is calling you to growth. God is calling you to be his chosen person to do whatever. Listen, I'm not saying God wants everybody to be missionaries. We wouldn't have anybody here at church if you were all missionaries. Some of you are going to work regular jobs. But can I, some of you are going to school and say, listen, uh, but what I want you to understand today, no matter what God is going to have you to do, you need to have the same heart as Elisha did and the same desire. Because we already read what he asked for. Elijah said, hey, whatever you want, you ask for it. And he said, I want a double portion. He said, I want a double portion of your spirit. What was he asking for? The touch of God on my life. Listen, if, you're, if, you're, if you work for a, it doesn't matter what company you work for, if you work with, in that company with a touch of God in your life, you're going to make a difference in the lives of the people that are around you. If you're a student in school and you have the touch of God in your life, you're going to make a difference on those that are around you as they come in contact with you. You'll be able to be a witness and a testimony of the grace and mercy and the love of God because you'll be different than everybody else will be. Let's not be just who we always were. Because I got saved from being what I was to be something different. I got saved from being what I was to something different. Notice what happens here. We, we just, we'll go ahead and start reading again in verse 9. It says, and it came to pass when they were gone over, and we're going to come back to this here in, in a little bit, but they were gone over uh, the, the Jordan River. They crossed over the Jordan River, and it says, and Elisha, Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I, I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, thou hast asked a hard thing. You know why this is a hard thing he's asking? Because it's not something that Elijah could promise. It was not within Elijah's capability to grant this request. This was only something that God could do for Elisha. 
Elisha said, I want a double portion. Now, listen, he didn't say, I want to be twice as powerful. He didn't, want to, he didn't say, I want to be twice as famous. He didn't say, I want to be twice as well known or has twice as much influence. What he said is, I want a double portion of the touch of God on my life so that I can serve him. And he's saying, I'm inadequate and I can't do what you told me God's called me to do. I need the, a double touch of God's hand on my life because I'm incapable of doing it. He has watched Elijah heal. He has watched Elijah perform miracles. And he says, I've never Never done that. He's followed Elijah from the moment uh, Elijah placed his mantle on him ten years before this to this point. And he's never once preached. He's never once performed a miracle. He's never once done any of these things. He's watched God work in Elijah, but he's never done it himself. He says, listen, if I'm going to be the next prophet, I need God's hand on my life. Can I tell you, we all need God's hand on our life. Whether we're a pastor of a, of a mega church or, or, or a pastor of a church of five, whether, whether you are uh, working in some company somewhere or whether you're a school teacher or whether you're, you're a student, you can't do anything for God without the touch of God on your life. And we need to have a desire for it. And Elijah saw, and it came to pass as they went, verse 11. And talk that behold, there appeared a, a chariot of fire and a horse, of fi- and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it. Now, what did he say? Promise him? He says, "You've asked a hard thing, but if you see me when I'm taken, then you'll get what you're asking for. If you don't see me." You won't get it. What has, he, what has he done? He's placed the responsibility on, on God and says, listen, if you see me, the promise of God is you'll receive what you're asking for. When Elijah, Elijah was taken up, Elisha saw it. What did he have there? The promise of God, that he had the Spirit of God upon his life. Now, it's one thing for somebody to say, hey, God will put the Spirit of God on you. And it's another thing to walk in that Spirit. As, as, as children of God, the Bible tells us that if you're saved, that you had the Spirit of God within you. All of us, if you're saved, if you, by faith, trusted in Jesus Christ for your salvation, the Holy Spirit of God indwells you. It will instruct you, it will teach you, it will convict you through the Word of God, it will sanctify you as you read the Word of God. The Holy Spirit does a whole lot of things. But, uh, but, but he's asking for God to, to, to do more than just those things. He's asking for God to fill him and control him and do things that he can't do. That's called the filling of the Holy Spirit. It's the yielding of ourselves to God and and allowing God to control what we do and what we say. He says, God, I need a double portion of that in my life. Notice the next thing that happens. Elisha saw it and he cried, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof, and he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and he rent them in two pieces. That doesn't mean he, he, he stripped himself naked. He took his, his mantle that he was wearing and he took it and he t- tore it off and ripped it off in two places, in, into two pieces and he bent down and he picked up that mantle that had fallen from the shoulders of Elijah and he wrapped that thing around his shoulders because now he was the chosen man of God. And what did he do? He went back and he stood by the bank of Jordan. I want you to think about what's going through his mind right now. He's asked for a double portion of the Spirit of God. He said, God, I need you to do this. I, uh, I, I need you to work in my life. Uh, I've seen Elijah do all of these things. Uh, and he stood by that bank. And what we didn't read was just before he got here, he watched Elijah take that mantle, smack the water with it, and the water parted, and they walked across on dry ground. He's back in that very same river, moments after he's seen Elijah taken away. He takes that mantle, and he takes it, and he strikes the water. He says, where is the Lord God of Elijah? What he's saying is, have you kept your promise? What did he do? He acted in faith. He acted in faith. He says, God, I want you to do something that I can't do. God, I want you to show me that you are able to, 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 to do what has been promised to me. Elijah said, if I saw him take it up, that I'd have what I asked for. Lord, do I, do I have it or do I not have it? Because I saw him. 
And he took that mantle and he hit the water. He said, well, we don't do that kind of thing anymore. You're right. We don't perform miracles anymore. We don't perform it. We've never performed miracles. Can, can I just, can we understand that? We, man has never performed miracles. It was always by the hand of God. And God still works. You know, we, we pray for somebody to get saved. What are we praying for? A miracle of God. Well, we pray that God would work in a situation that God would help, that God would heal, that God would send somebody to, 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 to reach the people who, who are unreached with the gospel. What are we praying for? A miracle of God. Because no man could do those things on his own. When you pray for me to get up here behind this pulpit, I want you to understand what you're praying for is a miracle of God because I can stand up here and I can talk for a, whole, for a long time, but it's not going to make any difference in anybody's life or do any good for anybody if the Spirit of God isn't here propelling what I have to say and not what I have to say, but what God is saying into the hearts of God's people and doing a work in their lives, in the hearts of the lost as they hear the gospel, and God convicts them of their sin. Listen, I can't convict you. I might be able to make you feel guilty for a while, but I can't convict you, and I can't save you. It's God that does that. What are we praying for? We're praying for a miracle of God. Folks, what, uh, can, I, can, can I just lay my heart out on the table for you today? Uh, we need some people that are willing to say, where is the God of Elijah? And ask for something that we can't do. Ask God for a double portion of his hand upon our life. To do something in our lives to change us, to propel us, to, to use us in a way that we can't function on our own. That we can't perform. That we can't accomplish. Elisha was a man like that. We have a, in our in, in the midst of the, the ranks of, all, of Christians around this world, a few Elishas. But can I tell you, we need more. I want you to jump back to the beginning of the chapter. There's some things that we're going to come across here as we, as we read through this that we need to have before we come to a point. The first thing is, is actually found back in first, first, first uh, Kings chapter 19. Don't turn there. Uh, but that servant's heart. When, 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 uh, when Elijah took that mantle and put it upon his shoulders and said, God has chosen you, he said, okay. We need, we need Christians with a heart saying, okay, Lord, whatever you want. And if you don't have that heart, you can live your life, and God will give you a choice, and you can do whatever you want with your life. And you may be successful, you may not be successful. I don't know. What I will tell you, you'll never accomplish what God wants you to accomplish unless you have a servant's heart, a humble heart to say, okay, God, whatever you want for my life. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says this, uh, that, that we are to, 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 to... I'm going to read it, because I want to fumble it. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. So I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Understand, what he's saying is, you need to take your life. He didn't say, he didn't say, he didn't say a dead sacrifice. He said a living sacrifice. You know something about a living sacrifice can always drag itself off the altar. Right? Uh, he says, take your sac to yourself, your body, a living sacrifice, and lay it across the altar that's willingly, uh, uh, not, not, no strings attached, saying, God, I'll do this. If this is what you want me to do, that's not a sacrifice. A sacrifice is saying, God, whatever you want me to do, however you want me to live, whatever I can do, Lord, I'm going to lay myself right here, and you do with me what you will. Because I beseech you, brother, beg. I'm, he says, I'm begging you to make to give your body, your life, a sacrifice unto God. In fact, what, is, what does it say? A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. We're not talking about going above and beyond in your Christian life. We're talking about what is reasonable for any child of God to do. Can I remind you, you are not bought with a price, or you are not your own, but you are bought with a price. Christ died for your sins. He gave his life for you. He left heaven to suffer and die on this earth, to rise again, and to take his blood and anoint that altar so that once and for all, that sacrifice was done, and you could be saved. 
He did that for you. It's our reasonable service to lay ourselves on the altar of sacrifice and say, God, whatever you want from me, I'll, I'll do it. I am yours. We need that heart of service. We need that heart of service. Back to 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elisha, Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Now we're going to notice here as we read through this uh, fairly quickly, there are a few places that they stop. And these places are important. We're going to come back to it. But notice Gilgal is the first place. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Terry, here I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. The sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry ye here, I pray thee, for thou hast sent me, to, uh, sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold thee your peace. Elijah said, Terry, I pray thee here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. Notice, have you noticed a pattern? They're at Gilgal. Elisha says to, to Elijah says to Elisha, Listen, you stay here. God has sent me to the next place, which is Bethel. You stay here, I'm going to go to Bethel. And Elijah says, oh, no you don't. Because I know what's coming, and I'm going to be there. He says, okay, come. And then the sons of the prophets come out, and they said, hey, do you know what's going to happen? Yes, I know what's going to happen. God's going to take him away from me today. This is his master, his father, uh, his his uh, not not his actual father, but his his spiritual father, his uh, the one who's who who is uh, who he served and worked with and, and and helped for the last ten years. He says, "I am going to be there when God takes him home." He had a love for Elijah. He had a respect for Elijah. He wanted to honor Elijah. He wanted to be there. More than anything else, he wanted God to, to bless him. And God was, God was testing him. Elijah was testing him. And Satan was putting up roadblocks. Isn't it interesting that, that we need to understand that to have the commitment we need to, to go all in for Christ, to have that touch of the Spirit of God in our lives, we're going to need some resolve. Because it is not going to be easy. It is not going to be easy. There will, there will be things that come up in your life where, 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 where God's going to put things in front of your life as a test, as a trial. To see if things are going to be hard and if you're going to stick it out. And here's the thing. A lot of people won't. Now, something they can't is that they won't. That they're not spiritually ready. But Elisha was. Now, I noticed they also mentioned there were, uh, that there were the sons of the prophets, and, and they came out and they were, they were antagonizing Elisha. I mean, seriously, I know my, I know my master's leaving, and they, they kept coming out and reminding him, hey, he's going to be gone. You know, Satan's going to throw things your way too, and he's going to try to discourage you, and he's going to try to make you want to quit. Hey, listen, the ministry that you've been serving with is all over with. The, the guy who's been doing all the miracles and doing all the preaching for the last 10 years that you've been with him, he's going to be gone. What are you going to do now, bud? Discouraging. It happens in every single one of the places they go to. Right up to Jordan. I want you to understand, Satan is going to place things in your life that are going to discourage you in your walk with Christ. They're going to discourage you from wanting to follow Christ. But can I tell you, you're never going to reach the potential that God has for you unless you're willing to endure, unless you're willing to not quit, but to keep going, even though it's hard, even though people tell you you shouldn't, even though they say you're crazy. You give and you serve and you follow Christ until he makes you into what he wants you to be. And he uses you for what he... Listen, we're not all going to be Elishas in performing miracles. We're not all going to be pastors and missionaries. But you can be the... The greatest glory isn't in standing up behind this pulpit. But can I tell you this? Folks, this is not where the glory lies. 
The glory lies when your when, 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 when your spiritual life matures and you begin to exude the, the attributes of Jesus Christ. That's where the glory lies. The, lo- the glory lies in the nature of Christ. And there are many a man that stand behind a pulpit that do not live the life that shows that. There is no honor here. You know what the Bible calls pastors? Servants. Slaves. Don't look up at the men here. Look up to Jesus. Follow Christ. Don't follow me. Because I might fail. I might fall someday. I, 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 I pray that I don't. I, 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 I'm like Paul. That, that where, where I preach repentance and where I preach the living this life. That one day I might fall short of it. That I might not do. that. That's one of my fears. That I might cause somebody else to fall because I fell. Don't follow me. Follow Christ. Satan will put those things before you. God will put those tests before you. But they're, again, they're to test and they're to prove you. They're to, they're to check your resolve. And God will give you the strength to overcome if you're willing. Now notice uh, the, the different places they went. Gilgal is mentioned. Bethel is mentioned. <coughs> Gilgal is, 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 is an interesting place. If, if we would go back and, and take the time, we don't have the time to, to look at all. Uh, it, 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 Gilgal is the place where the Israelites came out of when they, they came to when they came out of Egypt. It's the place that they came to just before they entered into the promised land. And some interesting things happened in Gilgal. When, when they came out of Egypt, they'd been serving the, they'd been serving the Egyptians as slaves for 400 years. And they, they traveled through the wilderness for 40 years. Those that came out uh, and, and came to that point uh, in Gilgal, many of their children were uncircumcised. They say, well, what does that have to do with anything? Because God told the Israelites uh, that, that they were to separate themselves unto him. And the way in which they were to outwardly show that was through circumcision. Now we uh, now it's just a medical procedure today, right? Uh, uh, some people do it for their kids. Some people don't do it for the kids. The Bible tells us that we're not that we don't have to do it. It's, uh, the Bible doesn't tell us that we have to do it. We're we're not required to. Uh, uh, it's not we're not following the Jewish law anymore. But back then they were following the Jewish law. Now can you imagine telling your your 16 year old son, your 18 year old son, well son, we're here at Gilgal, and God has told us it's time to fix what we didn't do before. Yeah, I'm not getting into it too, too specifically, but we know what we're talking about, right? But what was that? Why would they? It would cost those young men something. It was going to cause some pain, and there was going to be some loss. I want you to understand, it was, this was a, a point of separation. It was to separate them from the people that they were going into, because they were getting ready to enter the nation that God had promised them, the nations that, the, 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 the promised land. And they were an uncircumcised group of people. This circumcision was an outward sign of separation from them. Not only that, but at Gilgal was the first, play, first, uh, the first time in 40 years that, they, uh, that they, the, the uh, Passover, they celebrated the Passover. They were supposed to celebrate that yearly, but for 40 years it hadn't been celebrated. That Passover was again a, a, something that separated them from others around them, those, those feast days. This was a, a place of separation. Can I say, as a Christian, if you're not willing to separate, if, if you get to that point in your life and you're not willing to separate from the world, to be different from the world, you're never going to mature as a Christian and be able to do what God wants you to do. The Bible says that we are to be ambassadors. There are only pilgrims. You know what a pilgrim is? As somebody who's traveling through a land that is not his. Now he's not there. Uh, I just, I, 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 I was reminded of this recently. Uh, we talk about the pilgrims coming from England. Do you know they did not come from England? They came from Holland. Do you know why they came from Holland? That's wrong. That's why they went to Holland. You no, know, the, the, the schools teach, well, many times the schools will teach it that way. But understand, they went to Holland to get religious freedom. And they had religious freedom in Holland. But you know what was happening? Their children were growing up and living like the people of Holland. Living the same, raw, raw, living the lives that, that they, they were being affected by those who were around them. They weren't separate. They weren't different. And so 
Then the parents said, hey, listen, we're worried about our kids. And they locked them, or they didn't lock them up. They, 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 well, they did, I guess. They put them on a ship, and they traveled to the new world because they were afraid for their children. They were able to, to, to worship God freely. They were losing their kids to the world. Separation. Separation. It's, it, it's, it, we're, the Bible says we're to be a peculiar people, a different. Now, that doesn't mean that we all go live, live away on a, in, in a lock-up place somewhere where nobody can come in. We, we get our guns. We keep the government out. That's not what we're talking about. We're to be in the world, but not of the world. Uh, we're, uh, it's okay uh, for the boat to be in the water, but when the water starts getting in the boat, there's a problem. Uh, do you understand what I'm saying? We, we can't let the water or the, or the sin of the world to, to come in and affect our lives. We read Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Until you're willing to allow the, God, the word of God and the spirit of God to transform you into what Christ wants you to be, until you're willing to separate from what the world says is right. The world doesn't set the standards. Understand that, young people. The world, don't let it set your standards. Don't let the world tell you that this is okay and this isn't okay because the world's understanding changes on a regular basis. Ask anybody from 50 years ago. This, they don't recognize this America. Do you know why? Because it's changed. Can I tell you what doesn't change? The Word of God. And we're to allow the Word of God to separate us, to make us a, a separate and distinct people of God. So they traveled to Gilgal. The next place they went to was Bethel. Now, now Bethel is, is interesting for this, for this purpose. And, and you go back into Bethel, uh, you read uh, in the book of Genesis, uh, uh, Abraham goes to Bethel. Uh, but uh, I think specifically of, of Jacob, the word Bethel means the house of God. Remember the story of Jacob and his ladder? If you went to Sunday school, you may have heard this. Uh, when Jacob is, is, is running from home because he's deceived his father uh, and, and tricked his brother, uh, he, is, he has stolen the birthright and he's stolen the blessing. Uh, he's, his mom says, listen, your brother's going to kill you, so you need to leave. So he goes out and he, he takes a nap on a, on a hill one night and he uses a pillow for a rock. And that night he has a dream and he sees this ladder that goes up into heaven and God speaks to him there and, and, and tells him that, that, that he, and, and the promise that he was given to his father and to Abraham, that promise was then given to him. And he came into and realized that he was in the presence of God. And listen, and, and that day when he woke up, uh, he, he took that, that thing and he built a monument there, an altar unto God and he sacrificed there. And there were times when he would come back to to, when he would get away from God for a while, it would, it would talk about him coming back to Bethel and it's coming back into the presence of God. Can I just say this? Until we have a regular time when we're coming to the presence of God and dwelling in the presence of God, you're never going to be able to fulfill what God has called you to do. You're not going to be able to... Uh, listen, you, might, you may act different. You may be separate. Listen, this, God isn't so much concerned as our outward appearance as what's in our hearts what I'm talking about is a daily relational walk with Jesus Christ. If you don't have a daily walk with Christ, how can you ever be used of God? Because you can't be filled with the Spirit. We need that daily walk with Christ. Can I encourage you? Uh, listen, the, 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 the busier that our days get, the harder it can, it can become to, 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 uh, to, uh, to, to do that and to set aside that time. But can I tell you, the more you have to do, the more important it is that you take that time. Uh, I, I, I get convicted when I read of men like George Mueller or D.L. Moody and Charles Spurgeon who would talk about, oh, listen, uh, George Mueller himself uh, had, was a pastor and ran orphanages and had businesses. I mean, he was a busy, busy man. And the more he had to do, the more time he would get up at three, four hours before he was, else would have had to get up and he would just pray and seek the face of God. I struggle with that. I'm not an early riser. I'm a, I'm a night owl. But can I tell you that we need a daily walk with Christ? We need a daily walk with Christ without that, without that walk, without being in the presence of God. And listen, you can be in the presence of God here at church. I pray that you are. You can be in the presence of God at home, in your prayer closet. But we need a daily present walk with Christ. Third, he goes to Jordan. He says, he says there in verse... Uh, Sorry, Jericho. And in verse 4, And Elijah said unto him, uh, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. 
What do we know about Jericho? Jericho was a, a place of victory, but it was also a place of denial. And what do I mean by that? Uh, when, when God sent, them, sent the Israelites into Jericho, they had their first and greatest victory. But that victory was to be unto God alone. They weren't to take any of the money. They weren't to take any of the clothes. And they weren't to take any of the animals. They were, to, they were to leave it untouched. That was an offering unto God. God gave them victory, but they weren't to touch it. We know, according to the book of Joshua, that somebody did. His name was Achan, and he was punished for his sin. He saw something. He wanted it. He took it. And God punished him. But they weren't to touch it. They weren't to take it. In fact, God cursed that land and, and, and said, cursed that city and said if it was ever rebuilt, that the man who rebuilt it, uh, they, they would lose their, uh, their firstborn and their lastborn. And the Bible records that that's exactly what happened years later. It was a place of, uh, of victory, but it was a place of denial. Can I tell you, uh, that, 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 and a place of death, can I tell you that there is only victory when there is death to self and self-denial? Until, until we're willing to take ourself aside, our desires and our wants, we're never going to be willing to follow God wherever he wants us to go. We're never going to be willing to say, God, I want the double portion of that blessing to serve you, and no matter what section, no matter what area, no matter what ministry, or no matter where it is, we'll never be able to do that because, well, I'm more important, and my wants are more important. Listen, that's, that's natural. That's human nature. To want me first and, 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 and me to be taken care of. And, and, but that's not to be who we are. Paul said that he died daily to self. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 says, says, says this. Uh, 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 how's it start? Galatians 2 20. My mind's going blank. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Thank you, brother. Uh, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. For the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. It isn't me that's able to do anything. It's me dying to self because I'm crucified in the flesh and Christ living through me, the Spirit of God living through me, that I might be able to serve him. That's what Paul said of himself. How can we be any different? We need to die to self and set ourselves aside that we might worship, that we might serve, that we might do something great for God someday. And listen, whether it's leading one person to the Lord or leading a hundred people to the Lord or ten thousand people to the Lord, it's it doesn't matter. You do what God leads you to do, and that's exactly all you need to do. We all know the names of D.L. Moody and Charles Spurgeon, well, most of us do, uh, uh, these great men of the faith, but we don't know the, the people that led them to the Lord, but can I tell you something? The world would be a lot worse off if they hadn't done what they were supposed to do. In fact, you can follow the line uh, from D.L. Moody, uh, I can't remember his name, uh, there was a young man who preached, uh, who, it, was a, it was a Sunday school teacher, and he, and he led D.L. Moody to the Lord, and D.L. Moody became this great preacher and preached all across America and, and, and England, and souls got saved, and man, was used greatly, and there was a young man who was saved in one of his ministries, one of his, uh, one of the times he preached, and that man became another man of God, and used, listen, and that's how it works. But somebody had to lead D.L. Moody to the Lord. And I can't remember his name. I've heard it. I've read about him. Can I tell you that that man fulfilled the work of God in his life? And he doesn't know. He has no clue the effect that his obedience had on this world. It's not about the numbers. It's just about being obedient to God. But he had to die to self. He had to be separate. He had to meet with the Lord on a daily basis. Lastly, we see this. In verse 6, And Elisha said unto him, speaking again to Elijah, said unto him, speaking to Elisha, Terry, I pray thee here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And as he said, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. Again, I am not going to stay back. You cannot keep me back. I will not leave thee. Hold your peace. He goes, just stop telling me to stay. I'm not staying. We need some people that are just going to keep going no matter what, what, no matter what they face. Notice verse 7. And the fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off. 
and they stood by Jordan. So they've traveled now to Jordan. And these men of the prophets, these men who have been discouraging him the whole time, they've come along now, and they're standing afar off, and they're going to watch. Now what do we know about the Jordan River? The Jordan River was a barrier between the promised land and the land that they traveled in for 40 years. There was this, it was not the land of Israel on the other side of Jordan, it was a Gentile land. And here you have Elijah going across the Jordan River out of his territory, per se. That Jordan River was crossed a number of times. It was a barrier uh, uh, for, for Joshua and the people of Israel as they, as they crossed over. And notice what happened uh, when that happened. They, uh, they, they, uh, the, the priests stepped, uh, this is back in the book of Joshua, they stepped into the water because God had commanded them to do that, and the water stopped running, and they walked across on dry ground. It was that barrier that kept them from going into the promised land. They went into the promised land and had victory. They fought their battle at Jericho. Uh, it, it, was, it was something that stood in their way from, from victory. It was something that stood in, the, stood in their way of going into God's will for their lives. Well, actually, has come to this point. And the, 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 men of, uh, the, the men of the prophets, the sons of the prophets, all men of God, have followed have discouraged them, but they followed, and they're watching afar off on one side of the Jordan. And Elijah takes his mantle and he hits the water. It separates, and Elisha sees another miracle of God as they walk across on dry ground. And it's there where God, where Elijah says, "What do you want? Ask of me what you want." And his request was a double portion. Can I can I tell you something? There was somebody still standing on the other side of the river. A group of men, 50 sons of the prophets, who were not going to get to watch Elisha go up into heaven, or Elijah go up into heaven. They were not going to be a part of what was going to happen next. Why? Because they stopped short of crossing the river. Elijah, Elisha said, I will not stop. Don't tell me to stop. That doesn't matter. Just hold your peace. That was a, that was a, a nice way of saying, be quiet. Shut up. I'm coming and you're not going to stop me. Why? Because he wanted to be there. Nothing was going to stop him. Folks, you understand there are many times there are, there are Christians that are separated. There are Christians that have a daily walk with Christ. There are Christians that, that uh, uh, they, they love God and, and, and they, 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 uh, they, they've had victory in, in their life, they're self-denied, but there's something in front of them, some boundary that they're not willing to cross. And you're never going to have true victory, and you're never going to be, reach your full potential for Christ until you cross that, until you walk away from that. Paul tells the Christians in the book of Hebrews, <coughs> he, tells, he says this, cast off the, the besetting sin and the weight. Right? There, there is sin in our lives, we're going to set that aside because it's sinful. But there are some things that aren't sinful that we're not willing to set down, and it hinders us in our Christian walk. It hinders us in what God would have us to do. Can I tell you today, you'll never reach your full potential c carrying around that weight. It's time to set it down. It's time to say, okay, Lord, whatever you want, however you want, God, I am all yours, 100%, 110% if that's possible, take it and take it now. We need men who are willing to say, men and women and, and young people who are willing to say, where is the God of Elijah? Who, who will come to a point where they ask God to do something in their life, ask God to use them in a way that, that is impossible for them to do something, but God can do it. We need men and women and children of God who say, God, where is the God of Elijah? It doesn't do any good to be standing on the other bank of the river. I have watched God work. In, in other people's lives growing up. And think, wow, that would be so awesome. Doesn't do any good washing from the other side of the river. Listen, there, God is blessing in, in, in our church, and, and I, I praise God for it. I want you to understand, it isn't me, and it isn't you. It's the Spirit of God that's working. But we need to come to a point, and if you're already there, praise God. Keep asking for it and keep serving God. But if you're not there and you, you've not set yourself there, then it's time to sell out for God. And listen, that doesn't mean God's going to change your direction. Maybe he will. It means he changes our hearts. It doesn't mean he's going to change your career. Though he may. But he'll change your hearts. If you go back and look through scripture, 
And and Scripture bears this out. For those that were willing, the will of God always found them. David was just doing what he was supposed to be doing, shepherding the sheep, when the prophet Samuel came to him and anointed him to be king. He was just a willing servant heart who walked with God. And the Bible said had a, 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 he was a man after God's own heart. Samuel was just a little boy serving Eli the prophet when he heard the voice of God say, Samuel, Samuel. He didn't even know it was God speaking to him until, until the prophet Eli. Can I tell you, you'll, you, you don't get it because of your background. You don't get it because of who your parents are. And you don't get it because of where you go to church. Eli's sons were evil and wicked. They grew up serving in the church. In fact, Eli was going to be, the message that that Samuel was to take to Eli is that the punishment of God was coming because of his sons and his neglect of dealing with the problem. You can't have the touch of God on you just because you come to church here. You don't have the touch of God on you just because your parents were saved or or you're related to somebody who had the touch of I don't care who's grand... uh, Don't misunderstand me. It doesn't matter that your granddaddy was a pastor. You don't know how many times I've heard that. Uh, going out and knocking on doors. Uh, my grandfather was a Baptist preacher. Good. So are you saved? Because that ain't going to save you. And it's certainly not going to put the touch of God on your life. You have to humble yourself and allow God to put his hand upon your life. In a moment, we're going to close in prayer. I have a time of invitation. Can I, can I just say this? If you're here today, God's speaking to your heart. Can I invite you just to humble yourself before him and ask God to place his hand upon you? Ask God for God to direct you in your life and to give you that miracle. Say, God, I am all yours. Maybe you're here today and you're not saved. The truth is, uh, God has a purpose for you too. And his first purpose for you is to call upon him. The Bible says that he would have all men come unto him. That he, would, that he would have none to, to... Understand, God doesn't want to send anybody to hell. Men and women choo, choose that. They choose to reject Christ. If you're here today and you're not saved, don't put it off. Don't say, well, maybe next week. If God is directing your heart and touching your heart, today is the day of salvation. There is, there, there is no promise of tomorrow. As a paramedic, I saw way too many lives cut short in an instant. We think of people dying of cancer or slow, torturous death. We think of people, and it, it is, we think of people, those that die of other diseases, slow and suffering long. And, and, but the, many people, many, many people die in car accidents, never wake up. You may not have a chance. And, and I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to educate you. Because many times we'll say, well, tomorrow, at another time. It isn't good enough to be almost persuaded. If God's touching your heart this morning, today is the day of salvation. Seek him today while he may be found. Father, I thank you for this day. God, I thank you for your word. God, I pray that you would that you were glorified and honored in what was said today. Lord, I pray that you would use it in the hearts of your people. We ask that you would direct the rest of this this uh, invitation time. Lord, I pray that you would work on each and every one's heart, including my own. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.